The serpent of modernism had reared its scaly head in the otherwise peaceful settlement of Dry Cove, and preaching Ike Buckner felt himself ordained to scotch the reptile. It all began when the teacher of the home ec class in the Backwoods High School introduced a daring innovation into the educational program of the Mountain Hamlet by organizing a girls' basketball team. The girls, needless to say, had taken to the idea with all the zest of the healthy young beings they were, but parental enthusiasm was sadly lacking. Within a week, a group of patrons had started an opposition party, and Preaching Ike was its noisy spokesman. His first skirmish was with his own fair and scrapping daughter, Flozy, who had announced at the supper table her election as the captain of the team. Now look a here. There ain't nary bit of sense in a passel of grown girls a playing ball like boys, her reverend father asserted sternly. I'm sending you to school to learn your books, not to be frolicking around like a jackrabbit. But pap, the young girl argued, Miss Tyler says we need to study and play some, and she says basketball is good, healthy exercise. Healthy? What does a gal like you care about being any more healthy than she is? You're as strong as a mule and never had a sick day in your life. If you're looking for exercise, you can just walk home and tote the firewood and slop the hogs, milk the cow, and help your mama in the kitchen. But Paul, Flozy persisted, Miss Tyler says all the up-to-date schools has athletics. It makes the students study the lessons harder after they play a while. Oh, shucks. The keeper of the public school conscience banged the table until the dishes clattered. Do you reckon us taxpayers are digging down in our jeans to run a neighborhood playhouse? It's just another fandangle these town folks have thought of. Those folks have never done an honest day's work in a cornfield or in a tater patch. Preaching Ike Buckner was a power in speech. The mountain folks said he was the rantinous, roaringest, rousingest preacher in five counties. And when he turned loose his wrath against the devil and his cohorts, you could almost see the grass wither, the leaves curl with heat, and human souls fry in blue blazes. Flozy, however, was a worthy daughter of such a sire. She stood five foot eleven in her bare feet, and in her nineteen years, she had worked many a grown man till a standstill with an axe or a hoe. And as for nerve, there wasn't a created thing, reptile, or any other varmint that she'd ever been scared of, not even preaching Ike himself. Consequently, when her father's characteristic outburst had spent itself, Flozy went back to school with his grudging permission to keep on playing basketball provided she should always get home in time to help with the chores and spend her Saturdays in the field. The team developed steadily under Miss Tyler's expert coaching and Flozy's vigorous captaincy. And what a team it was. Mountain girls, every one, tall, brawny, deep-chested, hard-muscled, and tough-winded. They worked hard and responded intelligently. Their chief defect, though, was a lack of speed and agility, but they were dogged and determined and their coach surveyed their work with growing pride. Dry Cove, on the other hand, had no gymnasium, so the new sport had to be staged on the gravel of the schoolyard. The problem of costumes was temporarily solved by Miss Tyler's ingenuity and the willing fingers of the home ec girls, which transformed faded print dresses into somewhat baggy bloomers and blouses, and rubber-soled sneakers, boys' sizes, served for the gym shoes though most of the team was accustomed to hoeing corn barefooted in traditional mountain fashion. Thus, they usually spared their feet the unwanted confinement. Instead, they made all the loose pebbles fly with their unsandaled soles. The first practice games drew regular circus crowds. The whole countryside seemed to have urgent business in Dry Cove. Reverend Ike, he came once. By accident, he explained, just to have one eye-filling look and he blew up like a rusty boiler. Lord of mercy, folks, he exclaimed in horror to the little group of the faithful, congregated in front of Silas Galloway's crossroads store. Them young women is a-praying around in the midst of a crowd of men and boys with nothing but a shirt on and a shaft, and ain't nary a sign of stocking on their limbs. It ain't decent. 
Any gal that gets out in a public place like that, a kicking up her heels and contorting like a calf, is prancing down a broad road to destruction. I'm going to take my gal out and keep her out. Hey, men, you're right, preacher, the storekeeper echoed. My Ann's in it too, and this'll be her last day. Despite these dire threats and prohibitions, however, the new sport flourished, and so did the fame of the husky team, the Dry Cove Boomers. It spread all the way into the darkest hollows of the scattered settlement, with Flozy Buckner as captain and Ann Galloway as center and left forward respectively. They continued to be the brightest stars in its all-star cast. Preaching Ike's crusade for the concealment of the female limb had nevertheless aroused such a widespread protest against the shirt and the shift that Miss Tyler had felt constrained to offer a compromise. From that day forward, the girls practiced in black cotton stockings, and over their bloomers, they wore wide skirts that fell to below their knees. Through the long autumn afternoons, the girls practiced diligently. They became less clumsy in their dodging and pivoting. Their passing, dribbling, and juggling, and shooting took on a semblance of a system in training. Meanwhile, the popular curiosity became less avid, and the crowds and the spectators got smaller. By Thanksgiving Day, basketball had been accepted as a part of the established scheme of things, but the zeal of the players never abated. Even on raw, wintry days, the hardy maidens, injured to cold and damp, often insisted on playing, though their coach shivered in a heavy sweater and coat. Quite unexpectedly, Miss Tyler received a letter from the manager of the Brownsboro High School team, inviting the Dry Cove Boomers to come to the city for a December game. Since the Brownsboro Brownies were reported to be the best team in the county association, Miss Tyler hesitated before accepting the challenge. She finally laid the question out to the team. Now girls, we have to remember that this would be just a practice game for the Brownies. They have a fine gym and a fast team, picked from 300 girls. They've played for years, and they expect to win the County Cup again this season. But if you're willing to work your hardest and give it your best, we'll sign up for the date. Whatever Flo says will be all right with me, Ann Galloway said after a moment's silence had fallen on the group. Well, if it's for me to say, then we're going, replied Flozy. Those girls ain't any bigger than we are, I reckon. Anyhow, we ain't scared to go against nobody. Well, fine, then of course we'll go, declared Miss Tyler. But girls, the coach added more seriously, if we make this trip, we simply must have regulation basketball suits. These homemade things are all right to practice in, but when we go to the city, we're going to look just as smart as those brownies. The question is, how can we raise the money? That brought on more talk and plans were suggested, none of which, for the obvious reasons, involved asking the girls' fathers for the money. Instead, it was agreed unanimously that this bit of financing was to be strictly personal and a private matter. I think I know how I can get mine, Flozy volunteered. Pep said last night that he was going to hire a man to trim that sassafras and mow the black briars out of the new ground so he can put the corn in in the spring. Oh heck, I can do that in two Saturdays. And I guess he'd pay me just as much as anybody else. Well, one way or the other, the money was soon raised and the suits were ordered, and there was little time to spare. Since mail got into Dry Cove at a slow rate, the entire team and their instructor were on pins and needles for the whole week, fearing they might have to invade the county metropolis in their calico rigs. But in fact, that precious package did arrive by the very last mail day before the team climbed into the mountain schooner for the first lap of the tiresome journey. As the lumbering wagon bumped over the rocky road, down the shadowy meanderings of Thundering Creek, the girls tore the wrappings from the package, examining the new clothes with excitement. The 20-mile wagon ride brought the bloomers down to the turnpike, where they boarded a bus for Brownsboro. At dusk, the bus driver got them down to their hotel, just as the electric lights began to blaze along the little city's highway. This was the first time that any of the girls had seen such a large town. After supper, they reveled in the novelty of a trolley ride to the high school, ten blocks across the city. The scene in the dressing room of the gymnasium was an exciting episode in an eventful day. The new suits were of the newest design, entirely sleeveless, almost backless, 
and with decidedly rudimentary trunks. The husky lassies from the hills certainly filled them snugly. Good gracious, Miss Tyler, is this all of it? Penny McMasters asked in astonishment as she surveyed herself in the big mirror. Well, there's enough there, isn't it? replied the coach smilingly. Well, I guess so. These town folks must be used to these kind of clothes. But they're sure to turn the dry cove folks pop-eyed when we get back home. Say, exclaimed Ann Galloway, panic-stricken. My dad and some other men at the store said they might take a notion to come down on the late bus and see the game. Oh, if they do, groaned Liz McKinney. We'll never get to go nowhere again or see nothing. Well, I ain't much scared that my pap will come, remarked Flozy Buckner with a shrug. But if he does, I'm sunk. And after two Saturdays of working on that new ground, too, believe me, I work for these clothes. The briars tore nearly every rag off of my clothes and most of my hide, too. You don't have to tell us about hide, Flozy, said Ann with a glance towards her captain's sturdy framework. You look like somebody drew a map of Thunderhead Mountain on your back. Truth be told, Flozy was a bit conspicuous in more ways than one. Her suit, to begin with, was a trifle bit more than snug fitting. Her muscular calves were golden brown with a tan that only sun, wind, and rain on a hillside cornfield can produce. But they still bore witness to those two recent Saturdays in the new ground. Both legs were crisscrossed with innumerable red scratches that would need several weeks for nature to erase. Flozy had sure earned the price of that uniform. I know I look like a skinned mule, she chuckled as she gave her teammates a final word of counsel. But girls, we came down here to play basketball, not to put on a beauty show. And we're going to forget our looks and keep our blinkers on the ball. And if any of our dads show up here in those seats, they'll have to look out for their own eyesight. At 10 minutes before eight, both teams emerged from their dressing rooms with a hop, skip, and a jump and began to warm up to the accompaniment of a deafening din led by the school band. The Brownie Sextet, a fast aggregation of trim, wily city lassies, sailed instantly into the preliminary practice, circling with almost dizzy and speed in a series of well-timed passes from center to goal each forward as she passed under the basket deftly tossed the ball in a graceful arc and seldom missed a shot. The girls from the mountains, dazed by the brilliant floodlight, the blare of the music, and the uproarious yells from the galleries, were some minutes in finding themselves. They were out of their element, like a team of plow horses before a grandstand on a derby racetrack. With the native self-possession of mountain youngsters, however, they rallied after a bit and remembered what they had come here to do. Considering the newness and the rawness, they made a fairly credible showing in the practice work. No doubt the new suits helped materially both ways, improving the team's appearance and strengthening its morale. Gee, Flozy, Ann Galloway whispered as the two paused for a moment to breathe. Just suppose these suits hadn't come. We would have looked like something from the big woods. Ours are just like the ones the brownies are wearing, only a wee bit shorter. They're real fighting clothes. And don't you forget it. In that instant, though, her eyes opened wide with astonishment as her gaze roamed upward to the spectator's seats. Lord help us, Anne, she gasped. There's Pap sitting up there, and your dad is right beside him. Yes, and a whole bunch of dry cold folk. And Pap looks like he was going straight into the mouth of hell. His eyes are bulging out and his jaw is dropping. But somehow, I'm not afeard of him tonight, nor those town girls, nor the devil himself. Sure enough, Preaching Ike and Silas Galloway and a dozen other patrons of the Seat of Learning on Thundering Creek had followed the team to the city and were ensconced in the gallery. Ike Buckner had first scorned the idea of making the trip, deeming it beneath the dignity of his high calling to patronize a place of worldly amusement. On second thought, however, he had decided that it might be his duty to go. Towns and cities, he reckoned, were the devil's own haunts and centers of wickedness. The perils that might beset a group of innocent maidens in such a place were grave enough to necessitate his personal presence. Besides, he ought to see for himself, just once, a few of the awful goings-on that he had so often and so stoutly thundered against from his pulpit. His worst suspicions were fully confirmed when his eyes fell upon the Brownsboro players prancing out onto the court. He just happened to see them first since he was sitting next to the home team's goal. Lord of mercy, was his horrified exclamation. I've heard about such, 
but I never thought I'd live to see the day that I'd see it with my own eyes. I'm thankful we made our gals wear clothes that's anyhow halfway respectable. But in that moment, he turned towards the opposite goal, and his breath almost stopped. He didn't recognize the dry coat girls for a fraction of a minute, and he was about to conclude that there had been a change in the schedule. Then Flozy strode forth at the head of the circling column of the Dry Cove Boomers. And there was no mistake in Flozy. In the same instant, five of his neighbors recognized each of his own offspring under the blazing electric lights. That the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Ike quoted solemnly the words of a text he had used more than once to point a scathing rebuke against the unblushing scantiness of the female apparel in this degenerate age. I ordinary come. It ain't no place for a minister of the gospel. You're right, preacher. Silas Galloway agreed fervently. What do you say we get out of here, away from this scandalous doings? Well, being as I'm here, I reckon I'll stay. But wait till we get them gals and that there teacher woman back home. Just then, the whistle blew, and the teams lined up for the initial toss. Flozy Buckner, playing center for the boomers, towered a full eight inches above her brownie opponent. The city girl, though, Seemed like she was mounted on springs as she shot upward to slap the ball in midair. But Flozy, scarcely rising to her tiptoes, thrust aloft her long right arm and pushed the ball into Ann Galloway's waiting hands. The brownie who guarded Ann was a short girl, but seemingly made of Indian rubber. Ann could easily have pitched her over the railing into the stands, but she couldn't get away from her, and she wasn't used to such lightning quick garden. Ann tried in vain to pivot. But she fumbled and lost the ball to her opponent. Within 20 seconds, it had progressed by a perfectly executed series of passes to the Brownies right forward who made a clean shot for the goal. The ball dropped through the basket rim and a white numeral two flashed upon the scoreboard. That was the inauspicious start of Dry Cove's debut upon the arena of interscholastic sport. It left the boomers dazed by the suddenness of it the Brownsboro fans went wild, scenting an easy victory and a fat score. It was the old story of science and skill matched against main strength and awkwardness. The mountain girls were taller, heavier, and stronger, but those town youngsters were quicker, better trained, and cocksure themselves. Besides, the boomers had a bad attack of stage fright. They seemed to have forgotten everything that Miss Tyler had even taught them. Before the first half ended, they had drawn nearly every penalty prescribed in the rule book. They held, shoved, tripped, charged, and double dribbled. The city girls spent half their time making free throws from the foul line. Nevertheless, the visiting team managed to score an occasional field goal, and those shots were greeted with groans and catcalls from the fans, and by grim silence in the little band of hillsmen. That silence was owing in part to the mountain men's total ignorance of the game. To them, it was only mad, meaningless jumping about on the part of a dozen utterly crazy and most improperly clad young women. The wild cheering in the stands was equally senseless. Preach and Ike and his scandalized compatriots could see no more point in the organized yells and songs and the synchronized exhortation to fight on team fight em than they could in the exhibition of lunacy that was playing on the floor beneath them. Before long, however, they discovered that there was a certain relationship between the playing and the cheering. It also grew clear that the player's interest was centered on causing the ball to fall through the rim of the suspended fishing net, and that the six city girls were doing this more often than their young antagonist. To the men from the cove, the most impressive part of the whole performance was the role played by the cheerleader in the grandstand. Now, although the game had started out to be a runaway for Brownsboro, the boomers had gradually begun to find themselves, and their end of the score began creeping up. At the end of the half, the board showed 26 to 12 in Brownsboro's favor, but the Brownies were tiring while the boomers were just getting their second win. Between halves, a group of adored fans sipping their sodas in the lower corridor held a council of war. I tell you, Herbie Wilson declared, those big stiffs are slow as Christmas, but they're strong as mules. This game ain't won yet. You said it, Herbie. A nervous, excited senior girl broke in, her voice between a whisper and a croak. They were scared to death at first, but they're getting over it. We gotta rag them and rattle them. And Herbie, 
You gotta give them the works. Yeah, that's it. Herbie agreed. Leave it to me. We're going after them hard. Especially that girl playing center. She's half the team anyway. I wish I knew her name. It's Flozy somebody. Two or three volunteered. Oh, right, 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 said Herbie. We'll give Miss Flozy the raspberry from now on. As the teams resumed their positions for the second half, the shrill voice of the cheerleader rose above the clamor. Hey, Flozy! My, how you've grown since we last saw you last. This opening sally was greeted with uproarious laughter. But if the visiting center noticed it, she gave no sign. Again, Herbie picked up the megaphone and shrilled out over the taunt. Say, folks, meet Flozy, the moon fixer from the tall timber. This effort had put a heavy strain upon Herbie's inventive faculties, but the effect fully justified the intellectual energy expended. The deafening roar that followed it was possibly responsible for two more fouls, which the referee chalked up against the boomers. Step up, good people, and see the female giant from Smokey, Herbie sang out once more. She's been around the world twice with Barnum and Bailey, the tallest specimen in captivity. This one so taxed its author's resources that he had to rest for some minutes after. Meanwhile, the Brownies scored two more field goals, but the slow, steady machine from Dry Cove countered with four. The last was a long shot from center by the female giant from Smokey. Herbie racked his brain once more. Careful, Flozy. When you jump like that, you might bump your head on the rafters. That one wasn't so good, as a pink he doll himself realized. Flozy responded by placing two more spectacular shots. Herbie's head was beginning to ache from the intensity. Then some kindly muse must have whispered in his ear. Hey, Flozy, he began. The dogs have been chasing her through the briars. Just look at all the scratches on her. The crowd yelled his delight. Spectators held their sides and tears rolled down their laughing faces. Then the girl's pallor vanished and a crimson flush rose on her cheeks. Preach and Ike from his seat observed her reaction and understood. He spoke quietly to Silas Galloway. That fellow there with that dinner horn is making a mistake. He figured on pestering Flozy and getting her devil so she can't play. He's got her mad now and I tell you right now, it don't do nobody no good to make Flozy mad. Preach and Jake had unconsciously become absorbed in the game. With native shrewdness, he had figured out a good deal of strategy in the contest. He saw that his girl and his neighbor's girls were fighting against heavy odds. With a slim chance of victory, he had even ceased to think about the unseemly attire. In fact, after one got used to their garb, it wasn't so shocking that it had seemed at first. He sensed the fact that the crowd was intently watching, not a carnal display of naked limbs, but a battle of wits, a clash of ardent wheels, and a fight to the finish. And Ike Mugner was bred of fighting stock. As for Flozy, she was in the fight now, with every inch and every ounce of her. She was everywhere on the floor, lips tight, teeth set, eyes always on the flying ball. Suddenly, the score was a tie, with two minutes left to play. The boomers had dropped to the floor during a timeout signal and calmly surveyed the mad scene above. Someone asked, where, where did Flozy go? Her place in the circle was empty. Two seconds later, a dramatic hush fell upon the crowd. Something was happening, unheard of in the annals of basketball. The statuesque figure of the visitor's captain had entered the grandstand and was moving swiftly on noiseless feet to the center of the lowest tier of seats. In that moment, Flozy snatched the megaphone from the cheerleader's hand and knocked him to the floor with it and threw him face down across her knee and rained down a shower of resounding wax upon the area of his white duck trousers, most convenient for the whacking. Then giving him a good two-handed shaking that made his teeth rattle, she flung him back into his seat. For a second, she stood there, dimly realizing that she had incurred another penalty for her team. In confusion, she laid one hand upon the rail and vaulted down to the court. Just as the whistle blew for play, the steel-girded gymnasium fairly rocked with the explosion of delirious mirth that followed. It lifted the spectators to their feet that didn't cease until the bang of the timekeeper's gun brought the game to an end. Nobody seemed to remember or care whether the referee had imposed the penalty or not. Only a handful of fans recovered their composure in time to see Flozy's superb throw that gave the Boomers a two-point victory in the last five seconds of play. Herbie Wilson, they say, didn't think to ask who won the game till the next day. Preaching Ike, edging his way out of the gymnasium, came face to face with his daughter 
as she hurried to the dressing room. Gal, he stammered in a voice that was strange even to himself. Your pappy was plumb proud of you tonight, but for Lord's sake, get in there and get dressed. You ain't got enough on to water shotgun. <laughs>